spoiler warning, the following is an in-depth analysis. If you haven't seen this film, you might want to before watching this review. It's interesting sometimes how the entertainment climate of any given moment can affect how we view a movie. When Sub-Zero was released on video in 1998, it received mostly very favorable reviews. Going back and reading some of those, it's clear that for the majority of them, the focus was on the live-action film series and not on this movie itself. Joel Schumacher's legendarily notorious Batman and Robin opened in 97, and it was panned so hard that the release of Sub-Zero was delayed by several months to distance it from that film. Looking at the characters involved, it's pretty obvious it was originally intended as a tie-in, but those few months weren't long enough for those reviewers to wash that bad taste out of their mouths, and compared to Batman and Robin, this was a breath of fresh air. And so forget looking at it on its own merits, or at the very least comparing it to the animated series and that other movie it's set in the same continuity of. It's not campy, there aren't dozens of ice puns, there's no bat credit card, no bat nipples, and it seems like it's actually maybe trying to, I don't know, be about something. And so, this movie feels nearly like a masterpiece. I also get the sense that this being a direct-to-video feature and newspaper magazine critics were paid to watch whatever was new on video, many of them probably weren't familiar with the series, and for someone seeing this animation for the first time, I can see why that might be enough to carry a pretty mediocre story. Plus, the animation isn't just top-notch as usual, but Bruce Timm's team is trying some new tricks, playing with mixing traditional and computer animation, a lot of which felt more detailed and better integrated to me here than it even did in Batman Under the Red Hood. And it does a great job of providing the illusion of live-action cinematography with a lot of three-dimensional depth, like in the Powerpuff Girls movie, only more sophisticated, and a lot of soft focus, which I can't recall seeing very often in the show. This thing treats itself like a huge production, and yes, it's more compelling and can be taken more seriously than Batman and a Robin. I almost could say that about Catwoman, and I still can't decide which of those is the worst movie. But the question is, is that all we should expect from it? That it's better than the live-action bomb fans have been burning copies of for over a decade, that it was kind of supposed to be released as a tie-in for. I know there are a lot of fans who really love this movie, and I want to make it clear right now that my opinion probably won't be the popular one. But while it looks and sounds great and has a nice sense of atmosphere, the story is very mediocre compared to the best episodes of the series, and especially compared to Mask of the Phantasm. It stretches its plot to fill its running time, and it stretches credibility to make an unfortunately pretty contrived story work, and it distances its audience too far away from its characters to make it the emotional experience many of the best stories this franchise had to offer. I don't mean to sound like a raging Batman fanboy. I'm not saying that because I thought Mask of the Phantasm was brilliant, I don't like this one because it wasn't just like Mask of the Phantasm. But this being the second full-length feature, and since this team has done a pretty masterful job putting together the story of its first, it's hard not to compare them to see why Phantasm felt so compelling to me and why this one was such a letdown. And I really think, had this been the only feature from Batman the Animated Series, looking at this as an adult now retrospectively, I'd still feel about the same way about it. And part Partly why it's so disappointing to me now, too, is that I remember loving it when I first saw it at 13 years old. I'm pretty sure that at the time, Batman and Robin was still fresh on my mind, too. But let me reiterate, I think it's mediocre and just not character-driven enough, but not unwatchable. I'll do my best to explain what I mean. What Mask of the Phantasm really had going for it was a strong story centering on the character of Batman himself. We get into the protagonist's head, we get a good character study, we see him develop and grow over the course of the story. There are opportunities for change. Based necessary story stuff. That's two big strikes against Sub-Zero for me right out the gate. The movie is centered around Mr. Freeze, and you might argue that he's the main character of the piece. He makes the most crucial choices, and all the emotional weight is on his shoulders. But is he really the protagonist? This more or less unfolds like a traditional superhero story, after all, and while he has real legitimate reasons for the bad things he does, he's still clearly the, air quotes, bad guy, and Batman, Robin, and Batgirl are clearly the good guys. I won't say that if the movie had been entirely from his perspective, where we followed him almost exclusively, and the heroes were mostly in the background, made it clearly his story over anyone else's, that he couldn't have been made in the protagonist. After all, there are certainly episodes of the series that focus almost entirely on the villain, and he or she has a real character arc, despite being the bad guy. I'm thinking of shows like Harley and Ivy and Double Talk from the new Batman Adventures. But I just don't quite see that here. I get that idea set up in Heart of Ice that Freeze has become as cold on the inside as he is on the outside, so he's going to be cut off from the rest of the world, and it's understandable that we wouldn't necessarily get real far inside his exterior. I get why you wouldn't necessarily do a story that gets really deep into his head, although I think a little of that would have gone a long way to bringing him toward more of an arc, if this is supposed to be his story, and letting us know why his wife means so much to him 
perhaps even some well-integrated flashbacks to flesh out his character for us. He kidnaps Barbara Gordon because she has Nora Freeze's extremely rare blood type, and Nora needs an organ transplant after a submarine coming up under Freeze's Arctic hideaway ruptured her stasis chamber. And there are apparently no dead donors, so he doesn't hesitate to go after a live one. At the end, Batman and Robin find Freeze before his doctor can perform the operation. The idiot doctor makes a dumb move and catches the old refinery on fire with misplaced gunfire, and Mr. Freeze very briefly teams up with Batman and Robin to help get them all to safety. Mr. Freeze gets injured, Batman tries to help him, and ultimately loses him over a railing trying to rescue him. But he manages to survive to find that Batman got his wife to safety, and Wayne Enterprises is funding the organ donation that saves Nora's life, and it seems she's revived and going to live normally. So there are a lot of emotional things here for Victor Freeze, but I don't see really a character arc or anything new for the audience that we don't already know about him if we've seen his previous episodes. He's never brought to a place where he has to question his morally reprehensible actions. He's always fine with the idea of killing a girl to save his wife. There are really no consequences to his actions, save a broken leg, and I guess the knowledge that he won't be with his newly revived wife. But that's just not good enough for me. I do really like the ending. It's touching to see Victor happy, knowing his wife is finally okay, and the ice cast is a great touch. But if the story is about him, I want to know what he takes away from all this. Batman proves great compassion and regard for life by helping his wife despite the horrible things Freeze has done. Though, since Freeze doesn't know Bruce Wayne as Batman, he actually doesn't even know the full extent of it, and might still be giving himself more credit for saving Nora than he's giving Batman. His horrific plans still lead to his ultimate goal. Nora wasn't saved the way he'd planned, but his actions led to her being saved nevertheless. I wonder if he even has any problem with anything he did, or if this just further justifies his actions because it actually worked. Now, I could make a leap and say that his moment of change is realizing that all he had to do was go to Batman for help in the first place, and that that proves to him the world isn't necessarily the cold and heartless place he's come to know it as. But again, we don't get any of that, and so it's hard for me to call his story a character arc. All the notes that are hit about his character, as fascinating as they might be, are all in Heart of Ice. There's really nothing new here save the conclusion of the story about his wife, and Heart of Ice explored the character in less than half the time. With his little arctic friend he keeps around, Kunak, the movie tries to gain a little more sympathy for Freeze than he's had in the past, but this relationship isn't developed and seems kind of lazy to me. You can't just have a child tag along with the villain and say that makes him more likable without doing a little work to make that relationship credible. I feel like this script kind of understands why so many stories in Batman the Animated Series work but it's trying to turn that into a formula. And it thinks that by following that formula, it'll gain sympathy for its characters and create a compelling story. So it gives us a villain who's not just evil for the sake of being evil. It gives Batman some compassion for the villain. It gives Barbara some compassion for the villain. It has Dick Grayson desperately trying to save the woman he loves. And it ends with the villain, in a way, winning in the end, because what he really wanted wasn't so unreasonable. It's great on paper, but the execution is off. I feel very distanced from these characters. There's a whole lot of action and not nearly enough spoken exchanges. The best scene in the whole movie is the long chase where Dick tries to rescue Barbara. You can see all the pain he goes through during that chase, how hard he's trying, how badly he feels when he fails. But it's not personal enough between him and Batman. I mean, how does Batman feel about Barbara being kidnapped? He seems to be going through the motions like it's business as usual. And I get it, he's Batman, he doesn't talk very much about his feelings, and he doesn't buckle under pressure. But this is the girl Dick seems to be in love with. Where's that scene where Batman insists on doing it alone because Robin's too close to the situation? Or why isn't that at least addressed? If Batman doesn't say that in a situation like this, shouldn't Robin be surprised? And if you hadn't seen the show, you wouldn't even know at this point if Batman and Robin even know Barbara Gordon is Batgirl. There seems to be a lot of emotional weight in the action, but because the story isn't doing enough to make these characters come alive, I really have a hard time caring about it. This could very easily have been a story about Dick and Barbara, how much they care about each other, how difficult their relationship can be, both being crime fighters, but as desperate as he is to get her back during that chase scene, there's no payoff at the end when he finally gets her back. And Barbara, though certainly proactive and constantly trying to get away from Mr. Freeze, is pretty much the token damsel in distress here. I suppose in the moment her situation is pretty terrifying, and I like that Freeze tries to make her think that she's there to give a blood transfusion, and she doesn't discover it's actually an operation that'll kill her until Dr. Belson finally tells her he's going to put her under. It's also believable that she wouldn't be able to get out of this situation just because she's secretly Batgirl, since she's in street clothes and Freeze is much too powerful for her. But her role in this is just not that engaging. Like Mr. Freeze and Robin, it feels as though a way was contrived to get her in the movie because Batgirl was in Batman and Robin, and making her a random name on a list of possible donors that Freeze and Belson just happened to pick was the best they could come up with. At this point, I should probably point out how contrived and unbelievable I find this entire premise 
premise. And understand that if there was more to latch onto than retreaded character development and some really good action, this stuff probably wouldn't even be on my radar. But it's glaring when you've got a premise that might have worked alright for a 22 minute episode, but feels really stretched for an hour. Again, consider the pacing of a lot of those episodes and how much real story is crammed in such a short amount of time, and then contrast that with the equally dense stories of Phantasm and Return of the Joker, which felt like they needed to be that long. Perhaps I'm missing something, but I don't understand how Freeze's cryostasis technology works. The stasis chamber is broken, and Nora needs an organ transplant. It made me understand if, for some reason, she needed that to stay alive in stasis, where she could only be out of the chamber for so long before her body gave up, but without the transplant, she'd die even in stasis. Maybe the rupture damaged her internally or something. But if getting that transplant would not only keep her alive, but would also revive her and allow her to lead a normal life, why was she in stasis in the first place? Couldn't she have just had the transplant and be done with it? I realize that Freeze is only just now realizing she needs the transplant, but I don't understand how this Dr. Belson figured it out so quickly, and in all this time, Freeze never did. I thought the idea was that she had some debilitating illness there was just no cure for. But hey, forget all that, way more far-fetched is the idea that there are only 18 people with Nora's blood type, AB negative, and Barbara just happens to be one of them. This is the kind of nitpicking I rarely do, but bear with me, because it'll hopefully illustrate why I feel not nearly enough thought was put into this movie. And gasp, shock, and awe, I even did some math to figure this out. It's entirely ambiguous as to what only 18 people means. Freeze is looking for a female, because for whatever reason, gender apparently matters for this organ transplant, but no one ever says only 18 women, just 18 people with AB negative blood. 18 people out of what? Gotham? Surely not 18 people in the country or on the planet. I doubt the figures have changed that much in a decade and a half, so let's figure out just how many people there really are presently with AB negative blood, information easily accessible from a simple wiki search. In the United States, only 0.6%. Well, that's certainly very rare, but that doesn't sound like only 18 people rare. Rounded up, that's about 1,800,000 people in the US. Well, at least there's an 18 in there somewhere. But again, I'm assuming we're just talking about Gotham. So now let's choose a real city that's pretty comparable in size to Gotham. Well, Christopher Nolan used Chicago as Gotham in The Dark Knight, and I guess Gotham's not as big as New York. That's more like Metropolis. So let's use the population of Chicago. I don't know exactly which states have more AB negative people than others, so for the sake of argument, we'll use the same 0.6% figure for Chicago, which has about 2,695,000 citizens. So that would put about 16,170 AB negative people in Gotham City. That's not very many compared to the whole population, but it's a whole lot more than 18. So even if the list is just organ donors in Gotham, heck, even if it's just people who have been admitted to that hospital, and even if both Freeze and Batman are just looking at the women on the list, even though Batman never says that, that number is still ridiculous. So why in Batman continuity does AB negative blood seem to be one of the rarest natural commodities in the world? Because there had to be few enough people with that blood type that would buy the statistical probability of Barbara Gordon randomly being selected off a list. But even if that figure wasn't so hilariously made up, it's still a pretty contrived way to get her into this plot. And surely a better and more personal reason could have been dreamed up, something to tie all four of these people together in a more compelling way than Barbara's here because she has rare blood, Dick's here because he's dating Barbara, Batman's here because he's with Robin and his name's in the title, and Mr. Freeze is here because he's the big villain of the summer and because he provides a lot of visual atmosphere to the movie. It doesn't feel smart enough being a movie in a series that's often about detective work generally grounded in the physics of the real world. I don't have a problem with our heroes not being in costume most of the movie as it makes the animation more impressive because more of the face has to be shown and it's harder to make those expressions believable without something covering them. It gives the world some credibility to have stories where the characters aren't always in costume. Realistically, sometimes maybe they wouldn't be. But it risks coming off as dull and kind of lame when it doesn't have the script to back all that up. I don't like the token Batman and Robin versus a jewel thief fight and then a Batgirl versus some random thugs fight right at the beginning, all of which aren't tied into the main narrative at all, just there to remind us we're watching a Batman movie. I also don't like that it's halfway through the movie before Batman is even involved with or knows what the main conflict is. He gets very little to do, and it's a wonder Robin or Batgirl didn't get their names in the title. I think at least Mr. Freeze should have gotten top billing over Batman. It's definitely only got its moments. As I said, the action's awesome, the animation often breathtaking, and it has a definite strong ambiance, especially during the Arctic sequences. I'm impressed with the musical score, which isn't Shirley Walker this time, but Michael McGustin, who's more than a comp 
up in its stand-in, and I love that he scores the opening title nearly just like the opening of Tim Burton's Batman. It feels almost in defiance of Batman and Robin, as if to say, we still know and respect our roots even if the live-action franchise no longer does. Commissioner Gordon has maybe one of his best lines ever after Barbara is kidnapped when he says, Come on, people! A guy in a weird suit with two polar bears can't be hard to spot. And again, the whole movie seems built around that ending, telling us Nora's alive and showing Mr. Freeze finally happy, which on its own is a beautiful moment. I'm going to give it a 2 out of 4. Bye.